from training to performing, join our Big League Conversation. Welcome to the CSP Elite Baseball Development Podcast with your host, Eric Cressy. If you want to develop faster and train better, you need the best gear. And with that said, we've got some really exciting news for you. The number one baseball brand in the world, Rawlings, has partnered with us at Cressy Sports Performance to make getting the best training gear for you more affordable. Simply head to Rawlings.com and use the coupon code CRESSY20, that's C-R-E-S-S-E-Y 20 at checkout, and you'll save 20% off your order. This offer is only valid on select items, but there's a ton of great gear you'll save 20% on that will help you become a better player. So shop now. Again, that's Rawlings.com, R-A-W-L. L-I-N-G-S dot com and enter the coupon code CRESSY20, C-R-E-S-S-E-Y 20 at checkout and you'll get 20% off on your order. It's an absolutely awesome baseball gear that we use every day with our pro guys. Right now, there are a lot of good signs pointing to baseball coming back soon. We've already seen some startup at the youth level. Um, certainly, there's discussions about college leagues getting going, the ones that haven't been canceled. And obviously, there's discussions about the possibility of Major League Baseball coming back. We've already heard about the NBA and the NHL working towards um, some positive things in terms of restarting the season. And we saw professional golf start to come back and NASCAR as well. So, We want to at least pay attention to the sports medicine side of things, but at the same time, I think it's important that we make it really clear that it isn't to diminish the severity of the health challenges present in the world today. I think it goes without saying that baseball is secondary when people are losing their lives. First responders are facing immense challenges and tens of millions of people are unemployed. And there's a lot of uncertainty on more fronts than we can possibly list. So, um, you know, since reopening is already starting to happen, though, I do think it's appropriate to make sure to discuss how players uh, can stay healthy beyond just the coronavirus specific precautions everyone is hopefully taking really seriously. Um, so with that in mind, I, th- I think we need to review, um, you know, kind of two different dynamics that are going to be in play with respect to injury concerns. We have to have two separate buckets. So the first bucket, I think, is we have general athletic injuries and then we have baseball specific injuries. So for me, a general athletic injury might be a hamstring strain or a groin strain. Um, It could happen to just about any athlete, right? Anytime there's changes of direction, anytime there's full tilt sprinting, things along those lines. Um, Whereas I look at a baseball specific injury being something like an ulnar collateral ligament tear, an oblique strain, you know, like a thoracic outlet type syndrome. These are these are specific to some of the unique patterns that we see in baseball, whether that's the nature of overhead throwing, whether it's the aggressive hip shoulder separation that's in place. So we have to categorize those in those two big buckets. Um, And then the second one we have to look at is, you know, youth baseball injuries are going to be different than what we see with more experienced athletes. So as the best example I can give you is we very rarely see ACL tears in eight-year-old kids, right? But we often see, you know, fractures, um, whether it's stress fractures or, you know, just a kid breaking an arm, falling out of a tree. Later on, though, we don't see broken bones nearly as often um, as people get older, um, basically because all of a sudden you start to see muscles and ligaments become the path of least resistance. So we'll see a lot of ACL tears and, you know, 17 year old soccer players um, just because the, you know, the bones have become more skeletally mature. So, you know, for the sake of this discussion, while it's a broad estimate, you could basically say that youth component would be everyone under age 17 and the experienced athlete would be everyone over than 17. So our experienced athletes would be our college, our, our professional players that we're considering. And then on the youth side, as we get started up with you know some of the high school and middle school and even younger players that are looking to have a season this summer, um, we need to appreciate that they're going to be exposed to a different kind of classification of injuries. So, um, And with that said, what's really helpful right now is that we do have a little bit of, of history that we can look to um, both long-term and short-term to get a feel for what's happening in places where you know the world has actually started to open up and, and welcome back sports um, you know, in spite of what's going on in the world today. So um, Dr. Joel Mason at trackademicblog.com uh, had some great stuff that just came out uh, recently about the Bundesliga. So the German Professional Soccer League came back not too long ago. And they went from an average of 0.27 injuries per match pre-lockdown to 0.88 per game in their first weekend of games. That's an increase of 226 
uh, percent. So massive jump in injuries. And certainly there could be some roster manipulation that's going on there. So it may be a little bit inflated. But what's really important to remember is that they had 66 days off from competition, a little over two months. And in reality, that actually parallels a lot of what we're at right now with respect to Major League Baseball. Pretty much everything started to shut down in mid-March. You know, and here we are. I'm recording this on, on May 26. So we're kind of in that same realm. And we're, it looks like a couple weeks off from getting started if we're going to start up. Um, you know, and more anecdotally, but more importantly, specific to baseball, it looks like injuries are piling up early in the Korean baseball organization's return to action. So, you know, there's some, some baseball being played in Asia right now. Taiwan has also started up. What's interesting on the Korean baseball organization stuff, and, and again, this is anecdotal, they tend to be more of the soft tissue variety, and they tend to be very heavily congregated in the lower half. Um, so, you know, hamstrings, things like that. Um, I have heard of a wrist uh, issue. I've heard of an oblique strain, but not a whole lot on the arm front. So that's a really important differentiation to make at the professional level. And we're going to dig into this just a little bit later on. But, you know, those are the things that we know about right now. That's our, our, our first kind of glimpse into the fact that we are seeing more injuries as these leaks start back up. Obviously, soccer and baseball are markedly different, um, you know, dynamics. Um, but I think the other thing we have to appreciate, too, is, you know, Major League Baseball and even college baseball here in the U.S. may be, you know, a little bit more extreme velocity in our pitchers than we're going to see in Korean baseball, potentially. So um, certainly something to consider when you look at some of those stud college arms and look at some of the really big velocity guys in Major League Baseball, we're probably dealing with more forces um, just because they're, they're you know, better known athletes and probably more established in the game. So with that said, I do think we need to look back at some historical precedent too. Um, 2011, there was an NFL lockout that shortened preseason training camps from the normal 14 weeks down to just 17 days. So it was a big time time crunch to get guys ready for the season. And there was a really compelling write-up in the Journal of Orthopedic and Sports Physical Therapy later that year. And the authors of that paper reflected um, on, on injuries early in that season. And what they actually found was that in the first 12 days of NFL training camps, 10 players ruptured their Achilles tendon, and there were also two more in the subsequent 17 days thereafter. So basically in the first 29 days of camp, you saw 12 Achilles ruptures. Comparatively, um, if you look at some of the other analyses that have been out there over the years, the average number of Achilles ruptures in the NFL is about six to 10 per year. So basically they, they doubled it in the first four weeks. Um, that's a really big deal. And certainly those first two weeks seem to be the most critical in that regard. But what I thought was even most interesting about that the ruptures seem to occur with younger players than had historically been the case. You know, historically, when you hear about Achilles ruptures, you know, it's the 48-year-old man who's playing pickup hoops and he lands on a dorsiflexed ankle and that thing goes up like a, a window shade. So we usually view Achilles injury as more of an old guy injury. Um, and in this particular study, in that year of 2011, the NFL, the average Achilles injury was actually 23.9 years of age, which was six years younger than the normal um, injury for an Achilles that we had previously seen in the NFL. So that's a really important consideration because it was not the veterans that were getting hurt. It, it wasn't the guys who had understood how to prepare themselves and had six, seven years in the league to get ready for it. The people that were getting hurt were the unprepared rookies. And certainly the NFL over the years has had a lot more um, oversight on what their players do when they bring in people for training camps, um, you know, which, which aren't happening obviously right now because of coronavirus. So that'll be something that's interesting to watch later in the year when they try to start up. But it just goes to show you that when there isn't a whole lot of control and players are left a little bit more to their own devices and there's a quick ramp up, we are going to see more soft tissue injuries. So, um, you know, I think you're going to get a mixed bag of that in the baseball world, right? Certainly a lot of high school and college programs, the world has just shut down. Um, they haven't necessarily had a ton of interaction with their strength and conditioning coaches, their baseball coaches necessarily, and they may be going out to summer ball. Um, I'm particularly concerned for the elite high school players. I think we are going to see a lot of injuries, unfortunately, in those big arms, you know, in that 16 to 18 year old age group who are on that summer travel circuit. I think that could happen, A, because they're dealing with some pretty crazy arm speeds, um, you know, and they may not have gotten all their external rotation back early in the season. So we could kind of see a little bit of a, a ramp up here where we see some elbows go really quickly, particularly as they're trying to impress scouts 
and, and college coaches in a limited scouting window. Um, so I think that's something to watch really, really closely. Um, and, and certainly, you know, on the professional side of things, it's concerning as well because there's a lot of variability in what guys have had in terms of access to facilities and where they are geographically. Um, so just something to kind of keep in mind. Um, interesting, in 2011 in that NFL study, the number of injuries recorded within the first month of return was more than double the average typically observed over an entire season. So, um, you know, historically in professional baseball, we see injuries the highest um, really in March and April. You know, there's long, long discussed, I mean, there's long been discussions about the Tommy John epidemic that takes place in spring training. I don't think we're going to see that all over again, but I do think we can expect to see, you know, a pretty good surge in injuries early on in the season. And, and really what this speaks to is, there's a lot of great uh, discussion in the world today about acute to chronic workload in light of uh, Dr. Tim Gabbitt's excellent work. And I'd really encourage you to, to read up on him because he's, he's super insightful. And, you know, a lot of the stuff that we're hearing about in terms of load management is, is based on Dr. Gabbitt's research. But um, he actually highlighted the first study to investigate the relationship between the acute and the chronic workload ratio um, was actually done with elite uh, cricket bowlers. Um, which is a, a you know good comp uh, for for baseball playing obviously different stresses but similar motions. Um, they looked at training loads uh, for basically each session, and it was estimated based on the number of bowls balls they bowled, but also like their rating of perceived exertion for the session. And when the acute workload was similar to or lower than the chronic workload, in other words, they didn't exceed their normal capacity. The likelihood of injuries over the likelihood of injury for fast pitch bowlers in the seven days afterwards was about 4%. But what was interesting is when that acute to chronic workload ratio was 1.5 or above. So in other words, the workload in the current week was 1.5 times greater what that individual had been prepared for. The risk of injury went to two to four times greater in the subsequent seven days. So this is what we have to be cognizant of when players return, right? This is no different than what we do early on in spring training. The difference is what we have in spring training and what you have in college sports. What you have in high school is you've got time before your games, right? You usually have, you know, six to eight weeks. In many cases, players report early. So you have that month of January to kind of feel things out. They have a lot more accessibility to doing what they need to have a really good gradual ramp up. There hasn't uh, you know, been that level of convenience in the world. So where we're in a tricky spot right now is we don't necessarily know exactly what that person's uh, chronic workload is at now. It's probably lower than it was when they were built up during spring training, um, but it's probably you know, higher than it would have been during the first week of the off season. So to some degree, it's gonna be heavily reflected in, in the communication between athletes and, and players to figure out where people stand. Um, they've also done some of this stuff in, in, in rugby and soccer players um, and seen really, really identical results. When, when acute load relative to chronic load exceeds that 1.5 mark, things tend to go wrong. You know? and so what, what does that mean? You know, obviously, an easy example is if you have a relief pitcher who's used to throwing you know, 30 pitches um, and all of a sudden you send him out there and you, for 45 plus pitches, he's probably at a, a risk of going out there and, and getting into some trouble. So you have to be cognizant about jumping things too quickly. Um, you know, 1.5 is a big deal and we don't want to sniff it, but more specifically, there seems to be quite a bit of agreement. It's interesting, not just in the, you know, the high performance community, but also like the endurance community that, you know, 1.1 to one or a 10% increase from week to week is pretty appropriate. Um, so I, I think, you know, with me recording this on, on May 26th, if we're, you know, four to five weeks away from a lot of, you know, high school and college and professional players, you know, really starting to get out there and get competitive in games, I think what we need to really do is we need to make sure that those players are starting to build up their chronic workload right now so that nothing's going to surprise them when that happens. Um, so here are the two problems, though, as we look at this situation. The, the first one is, is very easily defined. There are a lot of factors that influence workload, right? There's your strength and conditioning stuff. There's your throwing program. There's your actual in-game work. There's the number of swings you take in the cage. There's how much sprinting you're doing. You know, and certainly there's the recovery side of the equation. You know, are you eating well? Are you sleeping well? All that stuff. So that's the, the first big one. But I think the second one is even more challenging and it's, it's really subdivided into a number of different categories. There's a remarkable amount of variability in what athletes have been able to do over the past, you know, 
two to three months, wherever they are. So the first thing I'd say is they've been quarantined. So they haven't had coaches and sports scientists on hand to do some of the daily monitoring that's often been in places, right? There are athletes that have gone to new places and had to quarantine for 14 days. So we've had a lot of people uh, you know, that have, have not had access to the resources that they're used to, right? When you don't have coaches that are used to pushing you, maybe you didn't train quite as hard, whatever it is. Maybe you didn't eat quite as well as when, you know, teams or, you know, coaches or sorry, colleges were providing multiple meals a day to you. I think the second thing is they were often training alone. So, you know, they didn't have access to training partners. A lot of people bank pretty heavily, you know, on those training partners to push them. I know of pro guys that are, you know, playing catch with their wives just to stay active um, because it's their only option. Um, you know, and third, they've had limited equipment um, access. They've had, you know, weather challenges. I know on the equipment side of things, like when this first broke, we had baseball players that were front squatting their significant others as a way to maintain a training effect. Um, you know, we had people that were using loaded up backpacks because they didn't have access to kettlebells. Um, and certainly we had athletes who had weather challenges. Um, you know, I know I, I talked to my mom not too long ago and they got snow in the state of Maine during the month of May. Um, so in those cold climates, that may have impacted their ability to get out, long toss, get off a mound, do their sprint work. Um, you know, I think fourth, there, there are probably a lot of athletes who have quarantined with Ben and Jerry's. So in other words, don't be surprised if a lot of them come out of this net less nutritionally sound than when they started. I don't know if we're going to have the quarantine 15, but, you know, certainly there are a lot of athletes um, anecdotally over the course of my career who they eat better when they train hard. It's, it's everything kind of works together. And, you know, a lot of those are the athletes that, that kind of go off the, the deep end or go into the deep end first month of the off season before they start training, when they're just recharging, you know, they tend to consume a lot of bad calories and then they start to lock it in the second they're training hard so i would not be surprised if we see some some pretty big weight shifts in athletes at all levels you know both good and bad after this you know this quarantine period and then i think the, the fifth factor underneath the second category is that we're counting on athletes to self-report and if we're being really honest that's something that athletes have historically not done well um, you know, we have more, you know, data monitoring, things like that, that people can do, whether it's wearing a whoop band or, you know, tracking sleep quality or something like that. Um, but we are counting on athletes to self-report quite a bit. Um, and you never really know if they're actually getting as much work in as they're saying. So, um, you know, there are going to be some athletes that aren't honest. And, and that's, that's unfortunate for them because it's going to probably, um, you know, put them in a position where the coaches that are managing them may perceive their chronic workload to be higher than it actually is. Um, so with all that said, you know, one of the things that we kind of have to do and we have to decide how bold we're going to be with this is we have to assume that many athletes are under trained unless they can prove otherwise. Right. So we all know we have certain athletes that will run through a wall for us. They'd be terrible at sitting around and not doing anything. Those are the athletes we can assume are, are coming in prepared and we can have those very legitimate conversations about where are you at? Um, you know, how do you feel? What do you think is the best approach for you to attack your throwing and your hitting volume? Um, how much are you going to be running the bases, et cetera, over the next couple of weeks? Um, but there are also going to be athletes that, you know, it's hard to necessarily agree with everything they say because you just don't know if you can take their word um, for how much they've actually worked. Because we all know that, you know, a lot of athletes who claim they train really hard don't actually train hard. And that's true at, at every single level. It's middle school, high school, college, or, or professional. So to some degree, we have to assume that athletes have a, a chronic workload that is lower than what we would hope it would be. Um, with that said, let's, let's return to the general athletic injuries versus the baseball injuries discussion. So on the general side of things, like I said, we're talking about hamstrings and groins. We're talking about calf strains. We're talking about foot, ankle. See that a lot in the baseball world when athletes haven't been in their cleats you know, for an extended period of time. They show up to spring training or something like that, and all of a sudden they're in the, the same you know, cleats that aren't necessarily that comfortable for four to six hours, and it you know, can really take their toll on the lower extremity. So I think those are our, our general issues. On the specific side of things, we're talking about elbows, we're talking about shoulders, we're talking about obliques, things that only really happen in, in high-level rotation. You know, obviously throwing a baseball is the single fastest motion in all sports, so you have a lot of susceptibility to injuries in the upper extremity if you don't approach it you know, carefully. Um, my feeling is that we're going to see more general injuries at the professional level because it seems like the one thing professional players have been really good about is continuing to throw. Just about every I've talked to, um, you know, and certainly all the players that I've interacted with at our Florida facility where I am, um, they've all found a way to keep throwing. Whether that's 
you know, long tossing with an old high school buddy or, you know, I know guys who are throwing bullpens to their brothers and their dads in the backyard. Um, you know, certainly there are guys that, um, you know, have plyo care balls that they're throwing a wall. I've seen people doing throwing drills with a sock in their apartments in big cities. They may not be going live against hitters, but one thing they've done is they've thrown consistently, and I would say the majority of them have been able to throw bullpens. So I don't think we're going to see this massive um, surge in Tommy John's and shoulder problems. I think we're actually going to see most pitchers handle a reasonably quick return to play at the professional level. College guys are a little bit more of a mixed bag just because I think the level of uncertainty is even higher there on whether college leagues are going to take place. Um, and I, I think additionally, players were pretty well built up um, both on the college side and the professional side before spring training broke. You know, there were starters that had gone over four innings. There were some relievers who had done back-to-back -back outings. So there shouldn't have been a dramatic detraining that, that takes place. And, and that's why I don't see us having a repeat of the spring training Tommy John epidemic or a boatload of, you know, anterior shoulder pain or lat strains. I think the only exception that we are going to see in terms of baseball-specific injuries uh you know at that that professional level is i think we will see some oblique strains and hitters just because the one thing that those athletes have not been able to simulate is is adjustability in the swing right those guys have have seen you know basically hitting off a tee they've done soft toss things like that but very few of them have been able to see live pitching in a while and certainly that's something that, you know, is, is going to come back slowly. All of a sudden, a 95-mile-an-hour fastball is going to feel like 110. Um, so they're going to have to adjust to that. But they're also going to have to adjust to getting fooled when it's a changeup, when they think it's a heater coming, something like that. And adjustments tend to become a little bit more problematic, um, you know, for athletes in terms of how they manage their hip-shoulder separation. So I'm expecting that they're probably going to be some oblique strains as we work our way back. Um, but I think that's something that can be offset if, if players, you know, gradually assimilate into the live uh, BP work and, and start to get some exposure there, particularly in the next couple of weeks before they report so that they can hit the ground running. Um, what I think players have missed out most on um, since the world settled down is, is probably sprinting and changing directions. Um, I know for me personally, I've programmed sprint, change of, work, change of direction work into all the programs I've written for, for athletes. Um, you know, and most of them have said they have no problem getting access to fields and things like that. Um, but we have to appreciate is that you know, some of those athletes may have been in cold weather climates where they couldn't get out for a little while. But it's also a lot different. We're talking about running the bases, getting in rundowns. We're doing so in cleats. Um, you know, these are the things that are going to have to be reintegrated appropriately. These, these guys are not going to be ready just to go out and play games on the first day back. So we need to make sure that we're, we're cognizant that the biggest concerns are going to be general injuries at the professional level. I think we're going to do really well with respect to specific injuries, but I think it's going to be the kind of thing where we're going to see you know, groin strains, hamstrings, um, stuff like that, that that comes just from the sprinting and changing directions pieces. Um, conversely, I think we're going to see a lot more specific injuries at those youth levels. And I, I touched on this a little bit earlier, but I think it warrants, uh, you know, reiteration. Coaches are casual observers uh, to physical preparation. So I think we're going to see a lot of overzealous coaches pushing kids too hard too soon uh, to make up for lost time and getting plenty of work in a shortened season. I wouldn't be surprised if we see coaches add tournaments on the back end um, because they missed them on the front end. Um, pushing kids harder into fall ball, uh, things like that. Um, I also think the nature of post-COVID restrictions um, is going to lead to a lot of abbreviated warm-ups um, and, and unprepared kids trying to light up radar guns to impress college coaches in a shortened recruiting window. If you think about like the policies of social distancing, things like that, if we're at these major tournaments and teams don't necessarily have access to the, you know, the actual field um, you know, in, in, until they can actually get right up to the dugout and the previous game has ended. I, I don't think we're going to see a lot of scenarios where uh, teams are given tons and tons of time to actually warm up on the game field. So that for me is a little bit concerning. Hopefully the coaches listening to this can really be advocates for their young guys and encourage them to do their best to get warmed up um, before they actually get out in those fields. Um, and the other thing we have to remember is a lot of young players just aren't powerful enough to pull hamstrings or strain a calf, but they can somehow find a way to throw hard enough to develop, you know, rotator cuff irritation or a little league elbow. So, you know, we know there's some research on, on amateur versus professional pitchers. Amateur pitchers, you know, tend to use like their, their rotator cuff muscles more for acceleration, um, whereas like professional pitchers will actually utilize latissimus dorsi more. And this is why we tend to see a lot more, you know, rotator cuff irritation in younger populations, whereas, you know, in the pro crowd, we'll start to see lat strains and stuff like that. Pros are more efficient. They use big muscles to do big jobs. 
you know, amateur players on the younger side, you know, generally kind of default to, to bad patterns in many cases, but they still sometimes have enough velo to do some, some considerable damage. So, you know, summarily, I think you're going to see, you know, more of the general injuries on the professional side and more specific injuries at the youth levels. Um, you know, so what are my recommendations? I think at all levels, coaches need to have candid discussions with individual players about what they've done, what they haven't done. And these conversations should happen sooner than later so that you don't get surprised when an athlete shows up and you realize that, you know, he's markedly underprepared. Um, you know, at the youth levels, we need to really make sure that the volume and intensity of throwing is managed carefully in kids who haven't been throwing of late. Um, and, you know, the best analogy I can give you is every year in Massachusetts, the high school baseball season starts the third Monday in March. And physical therapists are crazy busy the first week in April. And the reason is really simple. There's an injury surge of kids who start high school baseball practice right after they finish playing basketball. So they don't do a throwing program. They show up and they let it eat for two weeks. And all of a sudden their arm is absolutely hanging. So throwing is a very specific activity. Preparation has to take that into account um, with a gradual buildup. And, and, and I think what we're going to also see beyond just the injury aspect of things, I think the gap between northern and southern players will be larger than it's ever been at tournaments. Um, and the reason is very simple. Uh, you know, you, there just haven't been as many opportunities to get outside um, in the northeast. So a lot of the players in the south, uh, particularly some of these states opened up a little bit sooner, have been able to get out and long toss and hitting the cages and you know, you have more people who just have cages in their backyards and, and all that, whereas you just don't see that nearly as much up in Massachusetts and New York. And those are a couple of the states, Pennsylvania as well, that's, you know, that's been closed up for a longer time. So I, I think we'll see a lot more northern players have slow starts this year um, just because they haven't had access to the same amenities to stay sharp that a lot of the southern players have had. Um, at the college and professional levels, guys need to start getting back into their cleats ASAP. So if you're a professional athlete or a college guy, listen to this. You need to get out and do your long toss, throw your bullpens, um, do a little bit of your sprint work in your cleats just to get you know reassimilated to those just because it has been a couple months. Um, they need to be progressing to sprinting at higher intensities if they aren't already. Um, we need to transition them into an element of unpredictably as well. So you know, using things like coach-directed starts, um, you know, partner mirror uh, drills, taking ground balls and fly balls, we're actually reading stuff off the bat, or just running the bases and, and changing directions, things like that. Those are really, really important, and they're going to allow you to, for lack of a better term, hit the ground running once you actually get back into baseball. Because um, the worst thing that can happen is, you know, miss three to four months because of a quarantine and then go out and pull your hamstrings or your calf in the first week back. Um, I think our hitters need to see more unpredictable batting practice in moderate volumes if they haven't already. I'm not saying get in the cage and have guys, you know, completely fool you on curveballs when you when you think you're getting, you know, your nice groove, 70 mile an hour fastballs. But I do think there's there's a role for uh, for players trying to get more unpredictable BP in moderate volumes. Um, you know, moving forward here. And, and right now it's kind of a crunch time because it is going to be a probably a quick start up to every competitive season that's out there. And then, you know, obviously pitchers are the one that everybody's most concerned about. Uh, pitchers should already have been throwing. Uh, most of them have. If there are some that haven't, they need to come clean on that, and they need to begin a ramp-up that could potentially be a little faster than it would have been after a full off-season of downtime. So uh, that said, it's delusional to think that you can throw for three weeks and be game ready. Um, as a good rule of thumb, you know, there are a lot of people in the game, myself included, that think that for every day you, you take off, you need a day to build back up. So if you put on a baseball the second the world ended and, you know, it's been three months, you're probably looking at three months to build back up. You know, it may be a, a little bit of a scenario where you can accelerate a little bit on that, but, um, you know, if you've been shut down for over two months, you're really behind the eight ball if you haven't kept it going. Um, so the most important thing we can do for our guys who have been prepared is to not jump pitch cuts too quickly if they haven't remained built up. You know, kind of establish what that baseline level of, of chronic workload is and, and you know, add that 1.1, you know, each week. You know, so if it's the kind of thing where they've, you know, they've gone out and they've thrown 30 pitches, um, you know, in a, in a bullpen, then, you know, going and, and jumping that to 45, like we talked about earlier, is not a good place to be. You might just add a little bit between each session and, you know, solicit feedback for your athletes as you work. You know, I mean, that's obviously the case all the time, but probably especially important in this time. Um, you know, I don't think I have all the answers, but hopefully, you know, as you listen to this, you've, uh, you've, you've realized that we're asking some of the really important questions. And the, the best thing that you can do is talk to your athletes individually and start to piece together what they've done over the last couple months 
um, and then meet them where they're at as you do a gradual buildup. But most important thing above all else is right now, take advantage of these next couple of weeks, regardless of, of what the league is, whether it's college, professional, high school, it's not starting up tomorrow. It's starting up, you know, in the next few weeks, it looks like, or potentially even into July is some of the stuff that's been rumored on the professional side. So you do have time to build up to that. Um, you know, even if you're someone who has been completely shut down from actual baseball activity. So get out ahead of it with good conversations now, and it's going to pay you back tenfold once we actually get going. Uh, best of luck to everybody. I hope you're all safe and sound wherever you are, and we look forward to getting back to, uh, to watching some good baseball on TV and enjoying America's pastime. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the CSP Elite Baseball Development Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd be thrilled if you'd consider subscribing to the podcast and leaving us a review to read on iTunes. We welcome your suggestions for future guests and questions. Just email EliteBaseballPodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for your continued support, and we'll see you next episode.